Central Bank has reviewed upwards the cash withdrawal limits as announced earlier. In a circular, the bank said that the decision is based on feedback received from stakeholders. The maximum weekly limit by individuals is now pegged at 500,000 naira per week instead of the initial 100,000 naira. Weekly minimum maximum withdrawal for corporate institution was moved from 500,000 naira to 5 million naira. According to the CBN, only a cash withdrawal request above the limits for legitimate purposes, a processing fee of 3% will apply for individuals and 5% for corporate organizations. In addition, Third-party checks above 100,000 shall not be eligible for payment over the counter and prevailing limits of 10 million naira on clarity checks will remain. The CBN said it recognized the vital role cash plays in supporting underserved and rural communities and we assure an inclusive approach as it implements a transition to a more cashless society. The limits uh, are with effect from January 9, 2023. And in the UK, the House of Lords, Lord Hannon, uh, Baron of uh, King's Clare, raised concerns over the parli in Parliament over the rule of law due to the process and independence of public officials. He said, though the Nigerian is, is not a Nigerian, but the issues and binds Commonwealth nations together. In his words, it is not for me to say whether it is time for a redesign of Naira notes or whether such change will make elections cleaner. But I do feel friends of Nigeria and friends of the Nigerian democracy should defend the rule of law there at a time where democracy is in retreat globally. We have a stake in Nigeria's success, end of quote. On the attempt to detain the central bank governor, Lord Hannan said a member of the Board of Trade and Conservative Pairs says he hopes that Democrats on all sides will join Nigeria in supporting the independence of institutions in the run-up to 2020 elections, including, of course, the central bank. I mean, a lot to talk about these two things. I are you first, and after us, I'll come talk to Abati. Let me say, first of all, that it's good to see you, Rufai, and hope you are feeling stronger this morning. Still on the man, but... Yeah, right. thanks. Excellent. Let, let's Thank go you. to the news Mr. stories. Um, great news from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, this shows that the CBN, as promised, are listening. They said that they were open to review, despite the fact that they had mentioned that there was no going back on the policy review on the withdrawal limits, but that they were open to listening and engaging with stakeholders and the opportunity to review if they do see, you know, after a while, um, wide consultation, which obviously we've seen. So we see there that, um, let, let, let's take it back to December 6, when the CBN circulated um, a memo to um, banks, financial institutions, that they were going to be limiting the withdrawal, the, um, withdrawal of cash from ATMs and over the counter. What they had mentioned then was that 100,000 naira a week for individuals and 500,000 naira for um, corporate organizations. However, they have now revised this um, following the fact that a number of analysts groups had come out to particularly defend the underserved and communities in rural areas saying that they would be excluded and this push for financial inclusion is it then defeats the push for financial inclusion great to hear that or to see that this is one of the reasons the cbn has given for this review in terms of now the, in the, the individual limit per week is 500,000 naira, whilst for corporate organizations it's 5 million naira. What I'm looking, you know, what, what a number of people have said beyond this review is that the CBN has still said that the date of the implementation is the 9th of January 2023. We're going into the festive season. The first week of January is usually it's very quick and, you know, it's rushed before you know it. Well, the ninth is the second, I believe, the second uh, Monday of, of January. What, I, what we're looking to see is sensitization. We have seen instances where, let's look, take the, um, the example of the Naira redesign, for instance, part of the recent policies as well from the CBN, where some people had rejected. We saw videos um, going viral where some people had, like bus conductors, you know, saying that they didn't, they didn't recognize the note, so they were not going to accept it as a legal tender. And this is quite unfortunate, meaning that people are not yet aware. I'm glad that on this station we talk about this <coughs> a number of times, and that is part of raising awareness for this new policy. However, the CBN can actually also leverage their agent bankers, ensure that uh, they have you know, some form of posters, they, have, they encourage these ban agent bankers um, across the Federation to engage with their users who are mainly from the rural communities or who are chiefly, chiefly from the rural communities to understand that by the 9th of January 2023, this is going to be the case. People need to be aware. Banks, the 
themselves and financial institutions should also take it on as a responsibility. I know some of them have already done that, and this is done continuously. Emails to your um, to your um, customers, to your users, ensure this word is out there. There's no con there's been not a, there hasn't been a lot of contention as with regards to whether this policy is useful. It has said it would curb terrorism, um, it, it, it would curb banditry, vote buying as we approach elections. Hence the urgency with which this policy is being affected. Therefore, in order to make it work, we all must put our hands together. Now to the DSS story. Yesterday we talked about this and we um, we also mentioned Christian Association of Nigeria. Some experts would come out to talk about how unfortunate this development was with the DSS seeking to um, detain and uh, um, to arrest and detain the CBN governor on charges of uh, terrorism financing which the uh, Justice Soho in, in the federal, Abuja Federal High Court had thrown out for lack of evidence. A number of people have come out to say that this is perhaps politically motivated. And it's good to see the international community discussing this. Beyond that, in the report, the report says that also um, civil, right, civil organizations have come out to say that if we don't protect the independence of this body, it will raise red flags for international organizations, and Nigeria runs the risk of being blacklisted. We must pay attention to these, to these concerns and ensure that we protect the sanctity and independence of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Dr. Bati? Well, the CBN governor and the CBN, in terms of the policy, which was designed to re the, with regard to the redesign of the Naira notes, and also uh, the cash withdrawal limit, has received support from a number of groups. Uh, including uh, the Coalition of Defenders of National Interest. We mentioned two days ago uh, the chairman of the Christian Association of Nigeria, um, of uh, Kaduna, uh, the Coalition of National Interest Defenders, as I said, the National Youth Council of Nigeria, the Conference of Nigerian Political Parties have now you know, added, uh, his, has now added its voice. Also, the National Association of Nigerian Students uh, expressed support for the CBN governor. And in the same token, we now have voices from overseas uh, supporting the CBN governor and calling for Nigeria, making sure that institutions are protected as the country moves towards the 2023 general elections. Now you have Lord Annan, uh, who has been quoted at length, and then you have the Center for Financial Surveillance and Illicit Transactions, uh, which is saying that Nigeria runs the risk of being blacklisted if the uh, CBN or its governor are both subjected to uh, undue harassment. So the whole point of all of this has to do with the stability of the financial system. The fear that if the CBN governor uh, is uh, arrested or put under pressure, this could have implications in terms of investment, in terms of the stability of the system, also in terms of the independence of the central bank of Nigeria. This is not to say, however, that the CBN governor is above the laws of the land. We made this point. This is not to say, however, that the CBN governor has immunity. He does not have any immunity under the uh, Constitution. But the matter, in all of that regard, was resolved by the Court of Justice. So uh, the judge refused to grant expertise, the expertise application that the DSS took before uh, the jurist. And I had made the point that does the DSS have to even go to the court to seek the leave of court to you know, go after or investigate somebody who does not even have immunity under the 1999 Constitution? they probably didn't have to do so. But on top of it, the uh, judge pointed out that all the allegations being uh, presented were not backed by evidence. And the more important point, as Femi Falano SCM pointed out, was that this was a fundamental right case, and it was uh, expeditiously you know, uh, treated within two days by the chief judge, judge of the Federal High Court. Others will also you know, pick issues with the fact that this was a motion ex parte and oftentimes, you know, there have been complaints about how our courts handle ex parte uh, applications. So Justice Soho had been commended for, you know, the position that he took in the matter and said that, of course, if the CBN governor, if the DSS must go after the CBN governor, it must seek the express clearance of the president of Nigeria. That is that matter. What is new 
is the fact that you now have the matter being raised in the House of Lords in the UK and institutions abroad also indicating that they are, they are showing interest in you know, what is going on with the independence of that body. And don't forget, of course, that Section 1 of the CBN Act says this, the CBN is an independent body. The only qualifications, which I explained two days ago, is in Section 19, where the CBN, in certain instances, has to seek clearance from the president of Nigeria. Now, the other issue about the uh, cash withdrawal uh, thresholds. Well, what the CBN governor had said before now, when he appeared before the Senate, is that the CBN is not rigid about this. He made it clear that as the need arises, the CBN will review the cash withdrawal limit. And that's precisely what the CBN has done. And the statement issued uh, yesterday indicated that this is in response to the outcry of the Nigerian public. Persons who had said that cash withdrawal limit will affect small, small and medium scale businesses. Those who said that uh, uh, it will impose difficulties even on individuals uh, POS, operators of POS terminals also complain. And what the CBN has done with this latest development is to take on the concerns of those people, to say over the counter, you can withdraw in a week more than 500,000. However, if you are going to cross the limit, you will pay processing fee at the rate of 3%. A, a corporate organization can only withdraw up to 5 million in a week. If you go beyond that threshold, you pay a processing fee of 5%, but the limit in terms of check withdrawal of 10 million naira still subsists. And of course, the uh, CBM made it very clear that this will take effect uh, as previously announced on January 9, and that uh, uh, any bank or financial officer who contravenes these uh, latest regulations uh, will be sanctioned accordingly. And then, of course, there is that emphasis on KYC, know your customer. Every bank should do due diligence, the CBN says. And then, of course, the CBN reiterated regulations that it uh, put out after this particular uh, uh, cash withdrawal policy about terrorism financing, about illicit uh, processing of funds. And you know that is why I said two days ago that it was ironic that the same CBN governor who is insisting on the transparency of financial transactions to check counterfeiting, to check terrorism financing, is the same one that has been accused of uh, uh, you know, being involved in terrorist activities. Maybe you know, one way to clear the air here is for the D Department of State Services uh, to put information out there, if it has any, or to obey immediately the order of the court with regard to the fact that, you know, the CBN governor, no evidence has been provided against them. Hmm. Well, well, well. Righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach. What kind of nation do we want? Do we want to grow or remain where we are? I think we want to remain where we are. Why is all of this happening? Because Mr. Mefele, which is the, who is the head of the CBN, made a policy that will affect groups of politicians leading up to election, pure and simple. All the rigmarole role is just self-deceit. Because political cash will be stifled with this new policy. So we're trying to shut Mr. Mefele down and discredit the CBN. It's as simple as that. And that's why I ask, which country do we want? I understand the plights of the POS operators, but let's introspect on data. NDIC, National Deposit Insurance Corporation, in 2019 said about 2% of Nigerians, or some points, in fact, they said 99.4% of Nigerians do not have up to 500,000 naira in their bank accounts. That's what NDIC says. You can go and check the data out there. So people that don't have up to 500,000 naira back in their bank accounts are the ones that want to make weekly withdrawals of 500,000. Are we kidding ourselves? How much do most Nigerians withdraw? And for POS operators, yeah, I get their plight. Maybe they still run the businesses individually. Yes. 
But this is not about you, the POS operators. This is about the fact that people want decent elections in this country, but politicians will try to scuttle it. And where did this plot first start? It started with the stamp duty. Read between the lines. Don't just look at the headlines. 89 trillion was linked to the CBN. Till date, we've not been able to investigate it. But if you introspect on the number 89 trillion, did you try ask yourself that Nigeria collected 89 trillion in stamp duty, but Nigeria's GDP is just over 160 or 70 trillion? So we collected half of our GDP in stamp duty, and this cannot be accounted for. Then the next thing we're hearing things about terrorism. And the court has been able to kick against that. And all of a sudden, the limits have been increased. So leading up to the elections, we'll have increased limit of withdrawals now so that money can circulate for vote buying. Question is, what country do we want for ourselves? Yeah, some people have made the argument that probably the only thing wrong about all of this that Emefele has done is he wouldn't have put himself into the political arena by trying at some point to get into politics. That's a valid argument, and that's for balancing. But the question is, what country do we want? Do we want a country where the upper political class thinks it's about perpetrating themselves in power? And monetary policy can be changed. And that's why the British are raising a red flag. Because there has to be a level of independence of the monetary policy by the central bank. And they understand that level of independence. The question is, do we understand it here? What was wrong with the policy of setting withdrawal limits in a bid to check vote buying, in a bid to arrest rising inflation and the likes? What was wrong about it? Yes, probably it wasn't benefiting small business owners, which we understood. But these are things we could have reviewed in the long run. But now we've expanded the limits. Probably the politicians after all of this have their day. Then what becomes of Nigerian people? that the elections in 2023 will still be characterized by vote buying and the strong elite class still perpetrate themselves in power at their own interest, not the interest of you and me. So I ask for the opt-in time, what country do we truly want? Do we want a fair country that works for all or a country that works for few? Time will tell. Federal government has disclosed that its initial promise to complete a narrow gauge Eastern Railway corridor before the end of President Muhammadu Buhari's administration next year, was no longer realistic in inciting that insufficient funds as a reason. Buhari had two years ago performed the groundbreaking of 1.96 trillion rail project, saying it will stimulate economic activities in 14 states it covers. The benefiting state included Southeast states of Abia, Anambra, Imo, Eboi, Enugu, as well as other nine states, Rivers, Nasra, Benue, Plateau, Kaduna, Ayobi, Boronu, Bochi, and Gumbi. Then the Minister of Transport, Henry Boamechi, I uh, said that the Port Arcot Medjugorje line will be delivered before the end of the tenure of the present administration. But speaking on the issue yesterday after the Federal Executive Council meeting, in fact, presided over by President Muhammad Buhari at the State House, Abuja Minister of Transportation Muhammad Jaji Sam would disclose that financing the project had become an issue. According to him, the federal government has not been able to obtain foreign counterpart funding embedded in the project, making it impossible to fund it as envisaged. A lot to talk about. Monetary issues, Ayo. Yeah, monetary issues, but also um, linking to other issues that we have in the country. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, hopes dashed um, by the federal government. This project, this Eastern Railway project, would have benefited, as Rufai had mentioned, 14 states. And beyond that, looking at the economic impact, for the states. Analysts had looked at it, heralded and welcomed this development, talking about how it would, um, it would ease business trade along these lines, not just for these 14 states in the long run, for the entire nation as a whole. We can understand um, that's a, a valid reason that there's no, there no, we, we do not have enough funds because the foreign investment expected wasn't realized. It then takes us into a deeper issue of why are foreign investors not interested in such a great investment, you know, potentially um, great investment. Only a few months ago, the uh, federal government had come out to say that there were delays on the work, because there was delay on the work because of vandalism, um, security issues. Now, as an investor, 
would you be interested in taking up a project whereby you're, if at an investment, you're not sure if the next day or two months down the line, someone would come and steal your real tracks or there will be uh, people cannot ply that route because of security issues obviously not if we're going to attract investment as a nation we must begin to sort out our internal issues one of which of course with regards to this particular project would be security one of which of course is an environment that promotes um, private businesses to run and thrive. One of which, of course, is to um, to uphold strong policies to protect the interests of, 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 of investors. Very key. It is unfortunate that this isn't happening. A number of people had, um, you know, for a number of uh, business owners along that line and Nigerians at, um, at large had looked forward to this being actualized, especially with a definite date given before the end of the tenure, which is, you know, comes to an end formally May 2023. Also brings to question, I cannot but talk about the second Niger Bridge. Yes, it's open now, um, you know, temporarily before for Christmas to ease festive movement and to ensure that you know people are able to move uh, along that area but also it hasn't been completed we are told now that it will take six months it, it will definitely be completed before the end of the tenure with this it is it it's it helps it it it, it, it uh, reduces the confidence of people in the promises the government makes with regards to um, completing capital projects Unfortunate, and hope, hopefully the next administration, whoever will take on the reins of this um, government, would continue the project. Dr. Bati? Well, there is in place what uh, the uh, federal government calls the Presidential Infrastructure Fund uh, Development uh, Initiative, uh, under which many of these projects were designed, and the government has been taking them uh, one after the other either through the Federal Ministry of Works or the auspices of the National Sovereign Investment Authority. Now, with regard to the railway, there is general agreement that the railways will help to open up the country, will promote economic activities, will be beneficial in many ways, will reduce pressure on the roads, and in fact provide opportunities for better haulage of uh, certain categories of uh, goods. Uh, and so government focusing on railway, you know, was something very important. But as the president pointed out, when it was laying before the National Assembly, the uh, budget for 2023, he said the problem of Nigeria is revenue. Most recently, the World Bank in its development update also pointed out that the problem of Nigeria is revenue. If you don't have revenue, if your debt to service, uh, uh, debt service to revenue ratio is uh, over 86%, then where are you going to get revenue to do projects or to complete projects? Hence, government is perpetually going to borrow to look for money. And in this particular instance, this is a $1.96 billion uh, uh, project covering 14 states in the Eastern Corridor, linking the North and the South with even going through the middle, uh, middle, middle belt. Now, government is supposed to provide 15% counterpart funding. And that 15% funding is to come from the budget. So even government is in a difficult situation whereby it cannot meet up fully with its own obligations. The Chinese were supposed to provide a loan, 85%. What has happened is that that loan is not coming from the Chinese for now. And hence, that project is stalled. Contrary to the promise by former Minister of Transportation, Ruti Amici, that that rail line will be completed by June, uh, May 2023. So what is the situation? It's good that, uh, you know, it's not that it's been canceled. It's just that it's been suspended due to lack of funds. So where will government get the funds from? Maybe there will be people who say, well, we shouldn't get too much funds from the Chinese so that we don't find ourselves in the Zambian situation, so that in the future we don't find ourselves in the Kenyan situation. At the moment, one of the campaign promises of William Ruto was that he's going to pivot away from dependence on Chinese uh, uh, concessional loans and look towards the West. And that's precisely one of the things that he's doing now. But the issue, of course, is that if the project has started, Nigerians will expect 
that it to be completed. As for the second uh, Niger bridge, the Minister of Works, uh, Babatunde Raji Fashola, addressed that issue and said, yes, you know, that bridge will be completed. About 7.5 kilometers is still outstanding. What has been done is the Obosi end, but the, uh, 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 the Asaba end, about 4.4, 4.5 kilometers from the Asaba end, has not yet even, construction there has not even started. So in all of these projects, funding, of course, is the problem. And that's unfortunate, considering the fact that once upon a time in this country, Nigeria was so rich that the refrain then was that, oh, we have so much money, we don't even know what to do with it. And most of the infrastructure that uh, you know, came about in the 70s and early 80s, they, they were not heavily funded uh, by loans. But we have now reached a point whereby, as a result of how we've mismanaged our processes and uh, resources, we have to depend to do any big ticket project on loans. And these loans are not given free. This generation and future generations will pay that loan. So there's, a, there's a, a limit to which we can lament that, oh, we couldn't get foreign loans to do projects. You see, the problem with Nigeria is the fact that some Nigerians don't just love Nigeria. That's the biggest problem with this country. And except some Nigerians start to love Nigeria, this country will be a whole lot better. And especially some people in the political class. Let's look at this Eastern Corridor, and let's look at how it passes through that Port Harcourt Maiduguri rail line. That project was awarded in 2011, during the last administration before Buhari's administration, to a certain construction company called ASA. Till today, the National Assembly is looking into that case of what led to that project being abandoned, 3.2 billion, for a face of it. So President Buhari trying to do it now is a carryover for what was abandoned, because we all know what happens with projects. There are different scams of projects. Number one scam of projects is what they call variation. After you issue a project, it comes through variation, and people say, well, that money you issued before, we can't use it. That's the first scam. And it's a big scam out there by people that do projects. The second scam is even how you raise the money. There are times an agreement of the loan taking. When you say you put in a counterpart funding, of about 15%, other people say they were putting 85%, but the terms and condition is very nebulous. I'm happy that the federal government is honest enough to come and tell us now that this cannot continue. Because the Chinese are not putting money down. The question is, why are they not putting money down? Because maybe their interests are not being suited and they want to wait for the next administration and see who they will make a deal with. And they are seeing that this administration is long gone, so they don't want to put their money down, probably. I might not be correct on that. But when you look at it deeply, I keep asking, how can we look for a renewed mindset of being honest and transparent in projects? We've set up Infraco to be able to front projects. Some of these have come from uh, what, what's it called, uh, investment hub, you know, uh, national sovereign uh, investment, uh, and all of that, that used to be led by a very good friend, Mr. Oga, Uche Oga, before. That we use some part of it to fund the second Niger Bridge. But you see, we can truly fund projects if we're transparent, we're getting revenue, and we shun corruption. And I'm happy Dr. Abati talked about the 70s. But the sad reality is that we could have even done more projects in the 70s if we had not even squandered the money we made in the 70s. I'm sure we all remember. It was in the 70s we had the cement Amada, where we imported cement and we paid millions of naira that could have been done, used to do other projects in Demorage. So when some Nigerians start to truly love this country and think less of their own pockets, we'll fund projects and we'll be more transparent and we'll have a better country.